Chuck Ackery is a super investor with a multi-decade history of outperforming the various different U.S. indices. He attributes his success to following a model that's akin to a three-legged stool. The stool is focused on three key aspects, one of which is strong businesses with predictable, enduring free cash flow. Another key aspect is management that's aligned with shareholders, treats shareholders like partners. And the third key aspect is growth. Does the company have significant opportunities to reinvest either organically or or through acquisitions to drive significant growth ahead. One tremendously successful investment that he has done is with American Tower, where at one point he bought several million shares at about 80 cents. Now the stock is over $170 a share, so just a tremendous return. And so, and it's still American Tower looking at the funds that he manages is still a top position for the Ocri funds over a $1.3 billion position. So you're looking at this and it's over 10% of his portfolio. Looking at this, what does American Tower even do? So if you enjoy educational investment videos, you're watching Unrivaled Investing. In this video, I'm going to walk you through American Tower, why it still fits Chuck Ackrey's three-legged model, and where do I think it potentially goes from here. If you enjoy these types of videos, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. So let's understand what is going on with American Tower. What are they? So they're a communications real estate company where over 98% of their revenue is generated from leasing their properties. So the way to think about it is they own the cell tower. They will own or lease the ground, and then they will work with various different cell carriers that are their tenants that, and the tenants will own their own equipment and the tenants will effectively rent out part of the tower or rent out part of the grounds in which they're operating. So they operate the key real estate necessary for today's wireless communications network. This is a very beautiful business model, partly because of their significant operating leverage. The advantage of having three tenants on one property is significantly better than one tenant. They walk you through the economics of how one cell tower might cost, let's say, $300,000 with annual maintenance and property taxes of, let's say, ten dollars to $15,000 annually. But the difference between having one tenant that's paying $20,000 a year and let's say three tenants that's total in total bringing $80,000 a year is just incredible in terms of their gross margins, where that second and third tenant drives in significant operating profitability, driving in attractive return on investment. So if you are a subscale tower operator, you're going to not have great returns on investment. You need to have a fully leveraged tower to really get, you know, with multiple tenants to get the attractive return. Another key advantage for this type of business that American Tower operates is that they have a very recurring business. They have these long term tenants that sign leases for five to 10 years with annual rent escalators often tied to inflation. In the US, it's historically been tied to around a 3% rent escalator. But you see with various different international markets, it's tied to higher rates based on higher inflation. Another key competitive advantage for American Tower is that it's very sticky, very low churn. You know, you're talking about mobile carrier tenants typically only looking at one to two percent churn as a percentage of their billings per year because repositioning a site can be very expensive or adversely affect their network quality. It might just not be worth it to go build out a new tower on their own or have to work with the zoning and legal challenges. Why not just leverage the infrastructure that American Tower already has built out? Now, the flip side to this is that you do get some customer concentration with three core U.S. customers representing over 40 percent of their revenue. So any problems they face, T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, can quickly become American Tower's challenges, AMT's challenges. They do have a sizable international book that's around 40% of the revenue. So you do you know, see it is a diversified business with over 226,000 communica communication sites around the world. Really impressive what they've built. Clearly a business model over several decades that shows they have a playbook for both organic expansion as well as M&A. And that's one of the key aspects that Chuck Ackery called out is, you know, do you have this reinvestment opportunity? And when you think about, let's say, mobile service in Latin America and whether or not they want to have 5G over time and more and more data usage, you're going to say, oh, this is going to be continued growth investment over time. And that's a key structural driver behind this business is that you have more and more people going wireless that demand having a mobile services. And as they have mobile services, even with 
lower priced phones, lower priced smart smartphones, the data usage is just exploding at higher rates, meaning that these carriers need to spend more and more on infrastructure. So you're seeing increased mobile usage, driving increasing carrier revenue, which is driving increased network investments because they need to say, hey, we need to get that coverage. So they're working with partners like American Tower. Another core driver of their business, it's you know, it's not as mature as the rest of their business is focusing on data center where they recently in the last couple of years acquired CoreSight for $10.4 billion. So this is getting into the data center business, which is leveraging, you know, artificial intelligence and the growth there. But looking at it as a percentage of the total, once again, it's not really a key driver versus everything else. It's, you know, around five, six percent of their operating profit, a little bit more. You know, it, it's it's just not. The, it's it's growing faster, but it's just not as you know, it's, it's an attractive story, but it's not a key aspect to the thesis, I would say at this point. So then you're looking at this and you see American Tower, all this compelling data points that I'm sharing. And yet the stock is down around 25% over the last three years. So why is it down? What's going on here? So first, in full disclosure, this is not financial advice. Also, a quick plug, if you're looking to take charge of your investment journey with compelling ideas, market insights, and an exclusive Discord community available for annual subscribers, I personally let you in if you become an annual subscriber and you say hi on Discord. Come check out unrivaledinvesting.com for my weekly letter market commentary. There's also educational materials for those that are interested you know, in, learn, in terms of reading financial statements or learning how to value a business. Looking at American Tower, there's a lot of great stuff going on. They have a long history of generating attractive growth, attractive profitability, and stable return on investment capital. So there's a lot that's going very favorable to favorably. Why is the stock coming under pressure? I think it really comes down to three different reasons. So first, one should understand AMT is a REIT. So that's a real estate investment trust that is not subject to U.S. federal income taxes as long as they maintain their REIT qualifications, which typically includes distributing at least 90 percent of their income. So this is a company that historically valued based on, hey, what's the free cash flow that I can get? You know, what's the dividend yield that I can get? And previously, this was valued at under 2% yield. We're now in an environment where you can get, you know, closer to 5% on your cash. I personally keep my cash at Interactive Brokers. See the link below. And when you're in an environment with higher and higher rates, you can't really accept, let's say, a sub 2% yield, uh, you know, when, when you can get much better from, from cash. And then you're going to say, well, unless there's just tremendous growth. And we'll talk about that growth in an element in a second. So the first of the three key reasons, and they're all the three key reasons I, I'd argue they're all tied together on in terms of why the stock has been under pressure for the last three years. The first is multiple compression or just people are paying less for this business. They're demanding a higher premium in terms of the dividend yield for this business because we're just in a higher interest rate environment. Another key aspect is that they had to leverage their balance sheet for their acquisitions. You know, they do have this this very good playbook for acquiring assets and for investing. But it does result in debt on their balance sheet and management has made clear that they are in the process of deleveraging, i.e. paying down their debt. And they're sort of outside their window of, let's say, three to five times net leverage. And they're currently at five point three times. So they want to pay that down over time, let's say over the coming quarters, coming years. And, you know, I, I, I strongly suspect they'll easily be able to do it. Maybe they sell some assets in India or, you know, various different assets, you know, take, you know, their their core site data center business, they could sell more of the equity there if they wanted to. So there's a lot of different ways to bring down their leverage. But one should understand, oftentimes stocks perform best when companies have the opportunity to further leverage their balance sheet when they say, hey, we've got tons of spare capacity, tons of liquidity, and we see this great opportunity. Now let's leverage up, grow our earnings power. When you're in a bit when you're looking at a business that's saying, hey, we have a lot of debt, and interest rates are moving higher and we need to pay down that debt, that's less opportunity for that just crazy compelling M&A growth. And that's a key second reason why I think American Towers come under pressure is because they're in this phase of deleveraging. I personally prefer to find the businesses that have a setup where they could significantly leverage. You know, some of my top holdings have net cash balance, you know, net net cash on their balance sheet. So overnight, if they wanted to do a transformative acquisition, they could. 
you know, and that's very different from here where the balance sheet is pretty much tapped out. That's what management's saying. They said, you know, we could stretch it a little bit, but it's outside their own comfort window at this point. That's based on their own management commentary and how it's important to deleverage from here. Another, and this is a third key aspect, and you see how they're all sort of related, is you're seeing a surging interest expense where their interest expense surged 25% higher in the most recent quarter. And the challenge is that it could potentially surge another 40 to 50% higher in the years ahead, let's say over a multi-year perspective as they refinance their debt. A lot of their debt, you know, is only yielding, you know, sub 4%. So as they, you know, refinance this debt, you're going to be looking at higher and higher yields. So maybe another 40 to 50% higher in terms of the interest expense that they might have to pay in the future. So as I think about, you know, how this applies to a valuation framework and keep in mind, this is a hypothetical framework. Stock price can go way higher, way lower. I think if they're able to execute in line with where they recently, you know, have been doing over this past decade of, let's say, you know, high single digits, even teens type of growth, then you could see a very reasonable return in the years ahead. I mean, currently you have this stable dividend around three and a half percent, three and a half percent plus. Plus, if you're able to get some organic growth, you know, of let's say between five and 10 percent, then maybe you're looking at a, you know, high single digit to teens type of total return in the years ahead. The challenge is if you have any sort of further multiple compression, like we've seen over the last few years, then that would that could hurt the stock. And also if their organic growth is, let's say, only five percent or lower then I would say the stock would just, you know, maybe just be flat over the next few years. So overall, I like this. It's not surprising to see that this continues to be one of the top holdings for Chuck Ackery and his investment fund, you know, just because it has those three key aspects, the durable free cash flow management that treats shareholders like partners. And that third key aspect, you know, as they look at opportunities, for example, in Latin America to say, hey, there's just gonna be tremendous demand for data usage, we need to, you know, make all these investments in cell towers, you know, I, I think you're gonna see continued growth in this business. I just don't think it's going to be the hyper growth shareholder return that you saw previously. And, you know, it's great for investors. It's great for Chuck Ackery to have generated his 200 X return. I don't think you're going to see that, let's say over the next five years. I think over the next five years, I think it'll be more moderate, maybe high single digits, maybe teens if they execute. It depends on their, their execution. It also depends on market sentiment. You know, if the multiple stays around where it is, it currently trades around 25, you know, times free cash flow. I always prefer to look at things on a free cash flow basis. So if interest rates for some reason, for any reason, continue to drift higher, you know, obviously that makes cash more appealing, but then it could also mean lower valuation multiples for business like American Tower. Another key aspect that investors should consider is that, you know, there is some customer concentration. I do not like to see businesses that have significant customer concentration, especially when you marry it with a lot of leverage, you know, and when you have those two risks, it, you know, those two key risks combined, then it really creates some potential heartburn because if you have, let's say, you know, a business start to churn, it's extremely unlikely, I would think. But if for some reason, one of their key customers for some reason said, hey, we're going to pivot away. I don't see how in all honesty, just because, you know, they themselves oftentimes have very indebted balance sheets. So it's not like they're they're in a position to easily make tons of investment for themselves to buy these towers. It's just easier for them to use and leverage American Towers infrastructure and, and various different competitors. And so I, you know, I look at that as that's the midnight, you know, nightmare risk of you lose a key customer and you have this debt and then you have to deleverage very quickly. That's just a situation that I don't like to be in. So personally, I don't think American Tower will be part of my own investment journey, but I can see why other people would like it because of the stability, the free cash flow, and ultimately you're providing a key infrastructure asset. And if for any reason interest rates come lower in the future, maybe you even have multiple expansion in the future. I'm not baking that in in terms of my hypothetical valuation framework. So if you enjoyed this educational uh, video on American Tower, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching.